Exodus chapter 35. Um, as I mentioned several times in the past, uh, from Exodus chapter 35 through uh, 39, I think, yeah, up to 39, it's almost the same story uh, that we read from chapter 25 through 30. Um, then many of the uh, people ask question, like, why is the same story just repeating itself? It, it, it's just repetitive, right? Why, why are you writing the same exact story, you know, twice? Um, the difference between um, the context of uh, Tabernacle from chapter 25 through 30 verses 35 through 39 is when Moses went up to the mountain and what he heard from the Lord and what he saw from, you know, when he was in the mountain versus when he came down from the mountain, what, how he built it, what he built it. So, you know, we're going to probably conclude at the end of the chapters, uh, but you will see, you know, the difference between what he saw and what he heard from the Lord versus wh how he built and um, what he did when he came down. So we, we may be able to actually compare the differences between the two um, uh, areas here. So it's kind of repetitive, but we're just going to kind of like we'll go through and just kind of review what we have learned, kind of summarize it. So let's start with the chapter 35. Moses assembled the whole Israelite community and said to them, These are the things the Lord has commanded, uh, commanded you to do. The six days work is to be done, and but the seventh day shall be your holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whoever does, not, uh, does any work on it must be put to death. Do not light a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. So the first thing after he came down from the mountain and after, you know, all this riot, you know, of all this, the golden calves and stuff, like right after that was gone, the first thing he did was to proclaim to the Israelites, Sabbath, you must keep the Sabbath. So we just learned about Sabbath in the past. What is the meaning of the Sabbath? What is the meaning of the Sabbath? What is the meaning of a Sabbath? Is it important? If it is important, why is it important? And who is it for? Mm -hmm. It's for us. And why is it important? Okay, that's correct. All right. So, whoever does not enter into the God's rest uh, later on, and what happens to the people who does not enter into God's rest? They actually be punished, right? So that that is the explanation of this chapter thirty-five, the Sabbath. For six days work to be done. On the seventh day shall be your holy day. So from the six days for us is what. The days in this life, the days on this in, on, on earth, you know, our life spans. Should we just like sit back and you know and do nothing? No, we have to work hard. Those are the opportunity, the given to us, to do God's work. We're not born. We're not came to this world to just like run business. We're not came to the world to just like you know work like a bee. For us, we have each individually has a given task, and God created it for a reason. We already have the task that was given to us before the creation. So when we came to this world, we just don't know what we're supposed to do. So that's why sometimes we wonder, like, you know, you work hard, you go to good schools, and you work hard, you earn good money, and you buy whatever you need to buy, you know, houses, cars, and 
whatever. And then sometimes you th think back and say, what am I doing? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Sometimes you wonder. You just don't know where you're going. You just seem like you're lost. You know, where am I walking towards? Where's my direction? If I go where I'm walking right now, where am I going to end it up? People don't really think about it normally, but some days you start to think about your life, where you came from, where you're going, whether you, where you're going is the right way or not. God has given us this test, and throughout this life, we learn what we are supposed to do. Ultimately, we're here to learn about God. And not only that, since we learn about God, we actually want to tell other people about God until the day we die. So our ultimate goal is not only we have to uh, work to to earn what we need to actually use and eat, but at the same time, in addition, we have to actually preach the good news and talk about Jesus Christ in our life. That's the ultimate goal for us. And we work very hard during our lives. And then, at the end, we now go into His rest. And whoever does not enter into the rest, they're the one who's going to die. So at the end here, Whoever does any work on it must be put to death. Do not light a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. Now, once again, it is important for us to understand the Sabbath was, was for us. It's not for really God. We must enter into the God's rest. And then, after that, he mentioned, Moses said to the whole Israelites community, this is what the Lord has commanded. Pay attention to what Moses kept saying. When he started chapter 35, this is how he said, said to them, these are the things the Lord has command you do, uh, commanded you to do. In verse 4, Moses said to the whole Israelite community, this is what the Lord has commanded. What does he keep repeating now? This is what God said. Therefore, this is what you sh should do. These, this particular word, he said, God commanded you to do, is to keep repeating in this, the rest of the books. You're going to see it. From what you have uh, taken an offering for the day, uh, for the Lord, everyone who is willing to bring the Bring to the Lord an offering of gold, silver and bronze, blue, purple and scarlet yarn, and fine linen, goat hair, ram skin dyed red, and high, uh, hit the hides of a sea cows, acacia wood, olive oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragment, uh, fragrant incense, and onyx stones, and other jam to be mounted on the epode and breast, pl uh, breast piece. All who are skilled among you are, uh, are to come and make everything the Lord has commanded. So just keep repeating. This is what God commanded. This is what God commanded. So he just keep repeating this. Remember, this is what God commanded. Not because I like it. Not because I tell you what to do. Because this is what God commanded to me to tell you. The tabernacle with its tent and its covering, clasp and frame, crossbar, post, and bases, the ark with its poles and atonement cover, and the curtain that shields it. So, everyone who are skilled among you are to come and make everything the Lord has commanded. The skilled, what is a skilled? Are they good? Are they supposed to be good at what they do? What does that mean? Okay, so what is that supposed to mean then? You're skilled. So what does your, your Bible say? Oh, you have NIV? What about the Yonsu? What do you... Yeah, 
it's all skilled, right? You're you're skilled. So is that means we actually gain the skill to do this? Mm -hmm. So, when you actually look at this particular uh, verse, most of the scripture um, translated as skilled, who are skilled among you, are to come and make everything the Lord has commanded, is what it says. But when you look at the Hebrew word, it's not skilled. It's, it's leb. Leb means heart so whoever has a heart for the Lord to come and make this not skilled it is a heart whoever has a heart for the Lord so they bring all this in articles for them to to make this uh, tabernacle after they brought all the materials and how they brought it when you look verse 20 and on then the whole Israelite community withdrew from Moses presence and everyone who was willing and whose heart moved him came and brought an offering to the Lord for the work on the tent of meeting for all its service and for its sacred garments what is he saying? Everyone who? Everyone who is like dragged into it or everyone who just, you know, forced to bring things? Correct. Right. God only accepts things who are willing and has a heart for the Lord. Does God care what they bring? Or what God care is, what their heart brings. It's important to think. Many people boast about what they brought to the Lord. God does not care what you bring to the Lord. What God cares is what's in your heart. Are you willing to bring it to me? This is important. So, like Yonzu said, maybe not everyone who brought this. Whoever has a heart for the Lord is the one who brought it. So we may actually worry, hmm, what if, if, what if we have a shortage of material? What if, that, what if we don't have enough things to build a tabernacle? Because it, it's, it's not forced them to bring. It is not say everyone must bring it to it. Right? It is voluntarily they actually brought to the Lord. So we may have a worry. What if we don't have enough? Is that something we have to worry about? <laughs> Is that something we have to worry about? And, and if you were them, you, would you worry? <laughs> so it's like this. You know, we're trying to build God's house. We ask people to voluntarily bring some to the Lord. And you have to actually you know, bring a certain amount of money to the bank to, to either build or purchase a building. Would you worry? It is just important. God only, God only allow us to bring and willingness and heartful things to the Lord, and that's how God builds His temple. It's not with money. It's not about material. God only 
build his own temple or the tabernacle with the hands of a people who has a heart for the Lord. All who were willing, men and women alike, came and brought gold, jewelry, and all of all kinds, brooches, earrings, rings, and ornaments, they all presented their gold as a wave offering to the Lord. Everyone who had blue, purple, or scarlet yarn, or fine linen, or goat hair, ram skin dyed red, or hides of sea cows brought them. Those presenting an offering of a silver or bronze brought it, brought it as an offering to the Lord, and everyone who had acacia wood for any part of the work brought it. So they all brought all this good material willingly. Verse 29, All the Israelite men and women who were willing brought to the Lord a free will offering for all the work the Lord through Moses had commanded them to do. Once again, what is the word is keep repeating? Lord through Moses had commanded them to do. It is important to remember. Moses kept saying, this is not my desire. This is not what I tell you what to do. This is what God commanded to us to do. He just keeps saying, this is what God commanded. This is what God commanded. This is what God commanded. And later on, what you will see is, Moses and Israelite did what God commanded them to do. So what God commanded, they just do it. You don't ask questions why. You just do it because God told you to do. Because God commanded us to do. Verse 30, Then Moses said to the Israelites, See, the Lord has chosen uh, Bezalel, son of Uri, and son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and is, has filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, ability, knowledge in all kinds of crafts. Once again, God chose a people, right? Bezalel. What does that mean? We learned about this. Okay, so it's a two word, right? What is a cell? Cell means shadow, right? And L means God. So in the shadow of L, right? So this person's name is I am in the shadow of L can do all this. And then what? He was picked because he was smartest one or he was skilled? No. When you look at verse 31, it said, He has filled him with the Spirit of God. Well, what is this? the Holy Spirit with skill ability and knowledge in all kinds of crafts not because we're able to do it not because we're smart not because we're superior not because we're, we're better than others through the Holy Spirit he makes us to do his work many of the people think oh I've done this look at my achievement I have done so much no it is not you who made it. It is God who helped you to do this. You have to remember, any God's work, it is the Holy Spirit who works in us. It is not us. So, this is important things that we have to always remember. It is not because 
we are able. So when you look at Philippians chapter 4, Philippians chapter 4, Now, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petitions, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ and we're going to jump verse 13 I can do everything through him who gives me strength not because I am able not because I'm better not because I can do this because I can do this through him who provides the skills knowledge and ability to do God's work we always have to confess that it is not me who actually could do this but because of God gives me the strength and wisdom that I need that I can do this work let's just take a look at it. when we ask for wisdom what are we really asking for what are we asking Right. So let's just ask our question, you know, based on the scriptures that we know. Who received the most wisdom from God in the scriptures? Okay. Who else? According to the scriptures that we know, okay, whoever received the most wisdom from God is definitely Solomon. Right? Out of all other people that we know, right, Solomon is the one who received the most wisdom from God. But then, what happened to him? Well, how did it happen?
you, you have to you, you have to you have to go back to uh, your elementary school Sunday school that you learn right well that's that's where most of uh, Solomon's story comes out in elementary school Sun, you know during Sunday school that's what you hear the most Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So, so let's take a look at what he did. So, um, let's turn to First King. Let's turn to chapter four first. Verse 29, God gave to Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a beneath of understanding as measure, uh, measure less as the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all men of the East and greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. So God gave him the wisdom. Right? And let's turn to chapter 3 for a second. Verse 12. I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. So according to what God said, was there anyone wiser than Solomon based on, based on this statement? He's, he's literally saying there's no man on earth wiser than you. Before or after. Right? And God gave that wisdom to him. Right? So he did what he did. He built the temple. And he did a lot of good things, stuff. And then we're going to turn to chapter 11. Same book, First King, chapter 11. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides a pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, uh, Edom, uh, Edom, Edomite, uh, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them, because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had the 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wife led him astray. As a Solomon grew older, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father has been, had been. He followed Ashtoreth and Goddess and Sidonians and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites, so Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David his father had done. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and the Molech, the detestable god of Ammonites. He did the same for all his foreign wives 
who burned incense and offered sacrifice to their God. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So the Lord said to Solomon, Since this is your attitude and you have not kept my command, uh, co uh, covenant, and my decrees which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to the one you, uh, one of your subordinate. Nevertheless, for the sake of David your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. Yet I will tear the whole kingdom from him, but will give him one tribe for the sake of David my servant and for the sake of Jerusalem which I have chosen. So according to the scripture we're reading in 1st King, how did Solomon turn out to be? How could this be how could this be possible for a guy who received the greatest wisdom of mankind, right? There's no you know wiser man before or after this Solomon, he received so much of God's wisdom. And how this guy received God's wisdom turned out to be the idolater and failed to worship the Lord and fear the Lord. <laughs> so we all blame the woman. Exactly. It's because of you. <laughs> because of her. Right? Yeah. 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 Men are so easy to blame women. It is you. <laughs> <laughs> I was like <laughs> Okay. Uh, all right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> So the, my question is, I mean, this king, this man, received the greatest wisdom from, from the Lord. And God praised him about it. But how does man, you know, drove himself to destruction? How could this be possible? If this was a man's wisdom, yes, that's possible. But how could... How could a man who received God's wisdom could run into this situation? Yeah. So this is the kind of answers that we need to strive and we need to figure it out. How is it possible? Right? So we're going to just try to figure this out. How? So it was possible. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jess. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and will not delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by the what he sees with his eyes or uh, decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will, he will judge the needy, with justice he will give decision for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. 
with the uh, beneath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteous will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. So, what is he saying? A shoot will come up from the stump of Jess. From his root a branch will bear fruit. Listen. What is he saying? A shoot will come up from the stump of Jess. From his root, a branch will bear fruit. What reminds you? What reminds you? Jesus. And where do you bear the fruit? Branches. Okay. Hmm. Branches. Can you think of? John chapter 15 maybe what is he saying in John chapter 15 okay <clears throat> or can a branch bear fruit by itself correct the branch needs to be abide to the, the vine. Without that, you cannot bear fruit. So the branch itself does not have any ability to bear fruit at all. Right? It will only bear fruit when it stick to the vine. When the branch is broken off from the vine, you cannot bear fruit anymore. But let's continue on. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of power. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. So, where does the wisdom come from? Spirit of the Lord is where it is wisdom coming from. It is not self-generated. It is not self-taught. It's not something you practice. It's not something you learn. This wisdom, it is not the wisdom from this world. This is not the what we actually claim in this world as wisdom. Oh, you acted wise. That's not what we're talking about here. The wisdom, what we're talking about in the Bible, this does never come from our own self but it's coming from the Holy Spirit without that Holy Spirit without the help of the Holy Spirit we could never bear the fruit which means in Old Testament days which I mentioned many times did the Holy Spirit stay forever when he came in the Old Testament in Old Testament days, there was a work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit did it stay forever when He came. Remembered the conversations that we had or the lesson that we had in regards to the Holy Spirit of the outer being, inner being. Right, The outer being of the Holy Spirit, the work of the outer being of the Holy Spirit, does it stay forever or only stays for a short duration? Correct. So the Holy Spirit in Old Testament days stays until He fulfills the work and then He leaves. Only the Holy Spirit stays forever when the Holy Spirit came into us. Inner being of the Holy Spirit could stay forever. So Old Testament days, the Holy Spirit never stayed forever. That's why even the Holy Spirit was working with David when he committed adultery. The Holy Spirit was leaving that's why he said, 
in the psalm, do not take the Holy Spirit from me. Because he knew the Holy Spirit will leave. Right? Wisdom that he received through the Holy Spirit. When he was with the Holy Spirit, he was able to act wisely with the wisdom that he received from the Lord. But when he acted foolish because of deceit, because of a woman from other country, he blinded himself. And then not only he worshipped the Lord, but also worshipped other idols. Not because he was wise, not because he was just smart. He just lost the Holy Spirit with him. So, let's turn to Ephesians. Chapter 1. We're going to read from verse 15. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayer. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. All right, let's read one more time. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, and may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. So, the wisdom the Bible is talking about is what? What is the wisdom? Correct. The wisdom we're talking here is not about like being wise and do things. The wisdom that we receive from the Lord is to getting to know Him better. It's not about being wise or act wise. We know Him better. Therefore, because we know Him better, we can act better. Because we do what He commanded us to do. These are the people who follow the God's command. They don't really bring their own ideas about how the God's work should be done. These are the people who listens to God's word. What he promised, what he commanded to us is just do it. So this wisdom that we ask from the Lord is different than what we think of wisdom. So once again, God anointed and brought two people, right? To who? Bezalel, and then who else? Oholiab. These two people, God appointed these two people to do what? Build the tabernacle. These two people were appointed and God poured His Spirit to Him to build the tabernacle. But let's just think about it for a moment. What does tabernacle really mean based on what we have learned? What did you learn from the tabernacle? Tabernacle. Tabernacle is about Jesus Christ. 
this work and who he is, what he will do. It's all about Jesus Christ. So they received the wisdom to build a tabernacle. They're the, they're the expert at building the tabernacle. Right? So think about this. These two people are chosen to build a tabernacle, which means they're the one who had their skills and craftsmanship to build the tabernacle, which is Jesus Christ. Once again, going back to what I just showed you from the Ephesians. As for the spirit of wisdom, so that you know better of what? About God, about Jesus Christ. So then, I pray also, in Ephesians chapter 1 again, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be Unlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you and riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe that power is like the working of his mighty strength which he exists in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realm. So, what Apostle Paul is teaching us, the wisdom, ask for wisdom, he will give it to you so that you may know him better, so that you can actually go out and preach about Jesus Christ. So, the wisdom that we receive from the Lord is not about acting smart, being wise. It's getting to know Him better. Let's turn to John chapter 16 for a moment. John chapter 16, verse 13 says, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by t uh, taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it, making it known to you. In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. He's referencing the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit comes. The Spirit of truth will come. He will let you know what is mine and what is Father's, what is yours. He will let you know. So, let's take a look at James this time. James chapter 1. we we'll read from... Verse 2, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trial of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your fate develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. Because he who doubts is like a wave of 
the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. So, anyone who does not have wisdom, ask, he will give it to you through the Holy Spirit. But when the Holy Spirit comes, what does he teach you about what I told you before? To let you know what is Father's, what is Jesus, what is yours. He will tell you. He will, he will give you revelation. If you know what you need to do, but if you don't know about God's word, if you don't know what God commanded, how will you be able to do what he said or what he commanded? That's where the problem is. People do not listen to God's word. They don't know what God said. They don't meditate God's word. So they don't know what God commanded. And they just kept saying, give me the wisdom, give me the wisdom. Yes, God pours the Holy Spirit to you, but you have no attention to what God said. You don't know what He said, what He commanded to you. So therefore, the Holy Spirit cannot reveal you because you absolutely have no idea what God said. In order for us to have the revelations, in order, for has, in order for us to understand what we need to do, we need to have God's Word in our, in our heart. If you don't, there's nothing to be reminded. Coming back to Exodus, God appointed this Bezalel and Oholia to do God's work. This is what you must do. And remember, Bezalel as came from where? Which tribe? From the tribe of Judah. Right? In verse 34, And he has given both him and Oholia, son of Esh uh, Samech of the tribe of Dan, the ability um, to teach other, he has filled them with skill to do all kinds of work as craftsmen, designer, embro uh, embroiderers in blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and fine linen and uh, weavers. All all of them master craftsmen and designers. So, Oholiab came from the tribe of Dan. I mentioned this to you. Tribe of Judah and versus tribe of Dan. What is this? Tribe of Judah is where all the kings are coming from. Right? Tribe of Dan is the most wicked tribe. That at the end, it actually removed from the 12 tribes. Sinful. Judah versus Dan, together they build the tabernacle. Is the righteous and the sinner together builds the temple. For chapter 36, So uh, Bezalel, or Holyab, in every skilled person to whom the Lord has a given skill and ability to know how to carry out all the work of constructing the sanctuary are to do the work just as the Lord has commanded. When you are really anointed when you do God's work, you don't bring your own idea. You just do it the way God told us to do. Then people may say, Hold on, hold on, hold on. Listen, we're living in 21st century here. Whatever was applied a thousand years ago is no longer applied in today's technology. You have to be able to adapt the new technology and new generations and new things here. It doesn't apply what was applied thousands of years ago. That's what most people say. 
My answer is no. Whatever was applied in thousands of years ago is still applied today. No different. Yes, things have changed. The culture has changed. Society has changed. Law has changed. Culture has changed. Many things have changed. But you know what? These things will continue to change over time. Right? As has been changed based on our history, everything has changed. What does not change? God's Word never changed. The word he given to us thousands of years ago versus now hasn't changed. It's the same word and same commands. We have to obey what he said. Continue to do what we are told to do. So does that mean we have to build a tabernacle now? No, that's not what he means. <coughs> Once again, this is nothing more than a metaphor. It was just symbolic meaning of what this tabernacle means. So what does tabernacle do, by the way? If it is Jesus, now what? Without building a tabernacle, what is it? What do we need to do? All right, when you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 through 17. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred and you are that temple temple <clears throat> so do we have to build a tabernacle now do we have to build a temple now no we are the tabernacle when the Holy Spirit comes right so when you think about it the tabernacle what is the most important part of the tabernacle Ark of the Covenant. Ark of the Covenant. Right? Ark of the Covenant is the most important part of the entire tabernacle. What does so what's so special about Ark of Covenant?
<laughs> okay. Um, turn to uh, Exodus chapter 25. We're going to read from verse 8. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all this furnishing exactly like the pattern I will show you. And verse 22. There above the cover between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the testimony, I will meet with you and give you all my commands for the Israelites. So this Ark of Covenant is where the dwelling of the Lord. That's why it's important. Right? The God dwells there. So then, in today, whoever believes in Jesus Christ, they receive the Holy Spirit in us. Dwelling of God. I am the temple. No one can take it away from me. No one can destroy it because it's in me. So, the wisdom comes from the Lord, right? So, let's turn to, go back to a Corinthian chapter um, 2 this time. Corinthian chapter 2. And as a matter of fact, the chapter 1 talks about two different wisdom. Let's take a look at that one first. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 first. Verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to pre preach the gospel, not with words of a human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power so there is a difference between human wisdom versus godly wisdoms there are two different wisdoms okay many people get confused with the human wisdom versus godly wisdom godly wisdom is very different so that's why for the message of the cross is a foolishness to do those who are perishing but to us who are being saved it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since, it, uh, since in the wisdom of God the world through, its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs, and the Greeks looks, uh, look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, uh, a stumbling block to Jews, and foolishness to Gentiles. So, the wisdom that we receive is from the Lord and the wisdom reveals who Jesus Christ is. Without Him, without the Holy Spirit, there is no way that we gained the wisdom. Without the wisdom, we can never know who He is. So now you'll be able to actually tell why God was pouring the Spirit of God to Bezalel as well as Oholia to build a temple or the tabernacle. Because God's tabernacle could only be built by
by the Holy Spirit. Now turn to Zechariah for this time. Without the context of understanding what this is, but let me give you some context. Zechariah chapter... Actually, instead of... Yeah, Zechariah chapter 4. Zechariah chapter 4. <coughs> going to read from verse 6 and on. So he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. What are you, O mighty mountains? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone of uh, shouts of God bless it, God bless it. Let me give you some context to this. Do you know who Zerubbabel is? Do you have any idea who this person is? No. Okay. This is some. This is a name that you're probably not familiar with, right? So this is why we need to understand the context of the Bible as a whole. So this time we're going to turn to, um, we'll go to uh, Ezra, Ezra. Chapter 2. Now these are the people of the a province who came up from the captivity of the exile, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had taken captive to Babylon. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each of his own town, in company with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, ne uh, Nehemiah, and Sariah, and Reeliah, uh, Mordecai, and Bilshan, Mis uh, Mispar, Bigvi, Rehum, and Banai. Who is this? Who is this? Zerubbabel. Okay, now, now this time turn to Haggai. The book that you never turned. <laughs> well, I do. All right, hey guy, chapter one. In the second year of a king Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Who is a Zerubbabel? Oh. Haggai is between 
uh, Zephaniah and Zechariah. Zechariah is almost towards the, at the end. Yeah, people don't even know there is a book called Haggai. Yeah. He's he's what? He is the governor of Judah. When they came back, when they came back from Babylon, okay, who actually freed the Israelites from Babylon? Who destroyed the Babylonian Empire? Well, Persians, right? Persia destroyed the Babylonian, right? And who was the first king of Persia? Darius was the like fourth king. Cyrus. Right? Cyrus is the first king of the Persia. He's the one who, you know, to raise the uh, Persian Empire. He was the first king. He was the most bravest and the smartest and uh, you know the king of Persia and he took down um, Babylonians and then he freed all these people go back to their own land and Israel was the one of the uh, country so when you take a look at now we're gonna just go back and forth between Ezra again one more time Ezra chapter 1 we're going to read from I, I want you guys to read the chapter 1 from 1 through 4 Ezra chapter 1 Ezra is between the second Chronicle and Nehemiah. So right after Second Chronicle, that's Ezra. Right. Okay. A lot of the book, and you probably have a hard time finding it because these books are not a common books that most people read. So when you actually turn those books, there's no underline, there's no highlighter, <laughs> there's, it's clean. <laughs> All right. Read from chapter 1 verse 1 through 4. Yeah. All right. He was ordered by God 
to send the Israelite back to their own land and build the temple. I will supply all the materials that you need to build the temple. Go back and build the temple. And when people came back, so chapter 2, Verse 64, Ezra chapter 2, verse 64, read it. Yeah, that's the same thing. Yeah. Go ahead. No. Go ahead. Okay. So, at the time when they were ordered to go back, it was not forced them to go. It was a voluntarily for them to go back. After 70 years, okay, after 70 years, they were going back to Jerusalem again. So, once again, this is not the first generation. This is like a first generation plus second generation because most of the first generation passed away. Who are, yeah, so they're like, you know, the first generation was when they were, you know, young, they all brought to Babylon. Right, and after seventy years, most of the first generation passed away, and the either second generation or the third generation is Cyrus is telling them, "Go back to your own land." So it's like Yunsu, right? And it, like when you get married and you have a in another generation, they're like going back to Korea. What would you do? Well, it's like <laughs> I didn't hear you. <laughs> I go my way, right? What do you mean I go back to Korea? I, I was born here. This is my country, right? This second generation or third generation of the Jewish people, right? They were voluntarily want to go back to Jerusalem. To do what? What's there? Is there prosperity there? There are like big city there? There are like a, a good thing out there? There's nothing absolutely nothing there now you have to give up your pleasant life comfortable life everything what you built you have to leave everything behind and going back to this place you never even seen this is the land that they never knew before that's their parents or their grandparents land which have no idea what this land's like never been there but they volunteered to go back to do what? To build the temple. Have they seen the temple? No. Never seen the temple. But they all volunteer to come back. And when they were coming back, these are the number of people who volunteer to come back. Not everyone came back. Some people decide to stay because they lived, they wanted to live a comfortable life. They didn't want to come back. So only people who volunteer to go back to build the temple are the one who came back. And who led them to Jerusalem? There's the two people. One is Zerubbabel, and second one was Je uh, uh, Joshua, the priest. But when they were trying to build a temple, they built the foundation. But there was a lot of resistance from surrounding country. So they stopped. They thought, oh, maybe this is not the time for God, or, you know, for, for us to build a temple. Because there was so much of a resistance. They could not build. And then it was just, it was just left Nobody cared after that. After they built the foundation, they never did anything. And that's where the Haggai's came in. So this is what God told Haggai, the prophet, and say, Look, 
So coming back to Haggai again, now I want you to read from verse 1 and through verse 7. I want you to read. Now this time maybe Yonsu, you want to read? Haggai chapter 1. Haggai's right before Zechariah. So towards the, towards, all right, good, 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 good. Chapter 1, verse 1 through 7. Hmm? Haggai chapter 1, verse 1 through 7. It's okay. So, now you understand the context here, right? Right. Now, they built the foundation of the temple, but they didn't do anything because there was a, so much of a resistance. So, they they thought, to, you know, they thought, maybe this is not the time for us to build a temple. Maybe this is not what God wants right now because there's so much of resistance. So, they just left it. They were so busy building their own house for them to settle in there. And they start to blame Zerubbabel because of... Because of you, you didn't lead us properly. So they were all blaming Zerubbabel. And then Zerubbabel was so depressed. And then there was a whole other, you know, other story that you know, we can cover, but that's later. But anyway, so he was so stressed. But now, through Haggai, God told Haggai to tell Zerubbabel, it is not the Zerubbabel who are going to build my temple. It is my spirit who will build the temple. It is not. So then go back to uh, uh, the uh, Zechariah chapter 4 again. Now you're going to understand what this is. Zechariah chapter 4. Verse 6 and on. So he said to me, to Zechariah, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. It is not because you are powerful, not because of your mighty, because of my spirit, you will build a temple. Now you understand what, what this is about? Turn to Haggai chapter 2 again. <laughs> now you can quickly find it, right? <laughs> yeah. Haggai chapter 2, verse 5 and on. This is what I uh, covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heart, uh, heavens and the earth, the sea and dry land. I will shake all nations, and the desired all nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declared the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declared the Lord, Lord Almighty. This is what God is saying. My spirit has been with you, so don't fear. I will be with you. And through the Holy Spirit, 
I will build this temple greater than ever before. Now, this same spirit now comes to us. Build a temple in us greater than ever before. This is the temple that Jesus has been talking about. <laughs> All right. So now you understand why God appointed these two people and anointed with the Holy Spirit to do and build the, the temple of God or the, the tabernacle. Does it make sense? No, we're done here.